it comes down to the leaf or my hair, save my hair. Because I'll buy you a new leaf. Shoot. This is priceless. Okay? Ask short now. <laughs> there she is. Because <laughs> when I laughed, I was wheezing. I was like, I really woke up wheezing this morning. And I don't know why. And I sound like I've been smoking a pack. But you know I haven't. Cause I'm pregnant. I mean, slash, I don't smoke, but you know what I mean? Like, I definitely wouldn't smoke if I had a baby in my belly. Not to judge those who do. <laughs> <laughs> Carry on, moving on. That's how I get in trouble. You fixing to ask some real questions, huh? Well, I reckon it's time to get real. Are you ready? Ready. Okay. with another episode of Backstage Bonus. Make sure that by the end of this video, you like, subscribe, and comment in the comment section. So today, I'm gonna speak about something that's really deep and really personal. I mean, it'll be deep and personal, but we won't be depressed at the end. I'm gonna talk to you about my journey with postpartum depression, which is funny that I say we won't be depressed at the end, but we won't because there's hope and there's help. So, I don't know how many of you women have experienced postpartum depression. It's the reason I recorded the HEMS project that I did, Leave Me. And, um, you know, I just, one of the things I realized about postpartum depression is, it's one of those things that sneaks up and you don't realize you're kind of in the thick of it until you're kind of on the upswing coming out a lot of times and women don't get a lot of support with it because you just don't know you have it, so you don't know how to ask for help. So we're gonna talk about that today. If you've been feeling low, or you've been feeling not like yourself as a new mom, stick with this. I started feeling postpartum depression probably between six to eight weeks, at least, um, clearly, after my first son, Gabriel, was born. And the, actually what triggered it is, you know, you take your kid to their pediatrician when they're an infant and they're checking on your baby, but they give you a questionnaire to fill out that says, have you been feeling this, 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 and this? Are you sadder than normal? Are you anxious? Are you not wanting to do any of the things that you used to want to do? I had bonded with my baby, so I, I thought that people with postpartum depression did not bond with their baby, so I thought this couldn't be my issue. But I pretty much checked all the boxes on the questionnaire other than have you bonded with your baby. And we were in the thick of it, We, my husband and I, EJ, and we had taken time and waited to have our son. So we were. I, I assumed that I was just overwhelmed. I was very overwhelmed. I was very anxious about everything. Like, I could create a devastating possible scenario in any environment. Like, oh my goodness, those blinds could come loose and pop over and kill my baby. Like, literally, like, every day I could think of those things. And so I was just anxious all the time. I was fearful that I was gonna do something wrong to hurt him. And um, yeah, I started noticing those things first with the questionnaire, and I should have asked for help then, but because I thought I knew what postpartum depression was, I didn't. And by the way, do you guys know that 50% of the male partners of women who have postpartum depression have postpartum depression themselves? This is not actually a woman thing. This is a new person has come into the world and has rocked our world kind of thing. And so every day when the sun go down, we go down, we start to go down. Me and EJ would look at each other like, it's about to be nighttime again. Like, we gonna make it, how we gonna make it? And somehow a brand new morning with the sun and coffee <laughs> made everything better. But just one of the other things I noticed is that every night, I was getting sad, like, once again, here comes nighttime and I don't know that I'm gonna make it type of thing. It was, it was intense for a while, for sure. What triggered for me, I believe, and 
probably just for my environment, this postpartum depression was that I had a really hard delivery. I had preeclampsia, and so my blood pressure skyrocketed so high that it was, um, they were afraid I was gonna have a stroke, which would harm the baby. And then Gabriel's heart rate kept dropping really, really low every time I would have a contraction. So here I am in the hospital. I don't have much time to play around with labor and delivery because my blood pressure is not going down. And I had no symptoms. Like I wasn't dizzy. I wasn't seeing spots. I didn't have a headache. None of that. So it made me start to realize how women 100 years ago, 200 years ago, were passing away in childbirth and nobody knew anything was wrong because my blood pressure was super high and had no clue. So I don't have time to really labor and my son doesn't like contractions and I'm like, but babies get here by contractions, not my baby. He was like, no, you can stop all this because I'm gonna drop this heart rate and y'all gonna get me out of here another way. So we had to do an emergency C-section and that's what we did. But there is, whenever you experience trauma, there is, there are ripple effects. So I don't know what kind of trauma anybody has experienced in life, but you know, there's something to deal with afterwards. And I think the postpartum depression was our bodies and our minds and our hearts trying to deal with the fact that I almost didn't make it, Gabriel didn't almost make it, and that was scary. So now let's try to control all of life, which doesn't work. Oh, and yes, no, Gabriel does not sleep. Never did. Our kid didn't want to lay down. So we were holding him all the time. He had such bad acid reflux that we couldn't lay him down because he would be spitting up like crazy. What's that thing, GERD or whatever they call it? I probably should have gotten him checked out for that because he probably had some. And I'd be like, why well, my baby don't want to lay down? I'm so tired. So exhaustion on top of the trauma on top of life completely changing. It was just like a perfect storm for depression and anxiety. It affected, it affected everything. It definitely, um, as a wife, I feel like I was just numb and in some nebulous cloud. So, poor EJ, I don't, you know, bless his heart. He's very patient, but I don't, I don't remember any of his needs in the first year of baby's life because I was in a cloud. Um, and so it was, it was, it was difficult because you just, there was no way to focus in on, there was no way to focus in on another person's needs because I couldn't, I couldn't see anything outside of what's happening with this little infant. And so I probably just, got so honed in on Gabriel that EJ probably felt forgotten for a little bit of time. <laughs> oh Lord, that's horrible. But it's true, it's true. As a mom, it's um, <clears throat> it seems like it's out of love and concern, but once I started to get healthier, I realized this, um, this is out of anxiety and he doesn't, it doesn't feel like love to him. Even though it's more attention, it doesn't probably feel like love. And so, you know, it, it just affected how um, well, well adjusted he could be. And so just coming out of that, I tried to be more intentional about helping him to get adjusted in certain environments. You know, just coming out of that, like I will give you attention, but not because I am anxious and depressed. I'll give you attention because I'm your mom and you deserve it. As an artist, as an artist, I didn't know how I would ever sing again because I was as anxious as I was and as hyper vigilant as I had become, I was also still very numb. So you kind of can't be an artist from a numb place because the whole point of being an artist is connecting to an emotional place that other people understand. And if you can't connect to your emotional place, then I don't know um, how you can connect to others. So it was scary for a minute. When I say I didn't know how I was gonna sing again, like that's not a joke, that is real. That is very real. And it really was going back to hymns that helped me to feel again. Feel first for 
what I know to be true about God, and then <clears throat> everything else trickled from there. I think I realized that um, something was probably different for me than it was for other moms when I would have conversations and, you know, <laughs> people would be like, oh, okay. <laughs> and you're like, oh, you're not scared your baby gonna die every day? <laughs> okay, <laughs> like, this just me. <laughs> and so I think it's really, community is huge, you know what I mean? Like, cause you bounce things off of your community. And um, <clears throat> yeah, just realizing that people were responding to me with kindness, but also like the kind of face like, are you okay? Um, and along with the questionnaire at Gaby's Pediatrician. Um, and then I think as I started to, actually because I nursed my son, when I started to nurse less, I realized, oh, I don't always feel this way. And then I could link it to hormones. Um, as well and realize I'm a crazy person because of what's going on inside too. Like the trauma helped to trigger it, but hormones are real and they are um, they are going to affect how you live life. And so I think that was the first time I realized I also need to be gracious. Sometimes, you know, you encounter people and they just seem crazy or they seem um, edgy or whatever. You, act, you actually never know what's going on with them hormonally even because hormones have a lot to do with how someone interacts in life. And so I started to, you know, wean my son and I realized I'm starting to feel like me again. <laughs> and that's um, that was a big part of um, even being more intentional about getting help and finishing off that wean and like, peace out, playa. Nobody needs to be crazy any longer than they have to be. <laughs> so, that's that. Worship helped. In the beginning, um, when all I could do, all I, I had this infant who I was nursing all the time, and I was sitting at home, especially after EJ went back to work, and I realized, Oh my goodness, this baby is my full-time job because EJ just went back to his full-time job and I'm the one still here, so it's because he's my full-time job. Um, and all I would do is sit and I would um, <clears throat> I would go to YouTube and I would watch worship videos before I felt it. Um, I think What a Beautiful Name by Hillsong had just come out and it just was the first time that I was wrecked in the presence of the Lord after experiencing all this. And I was so grateful for it because I didn't know how else to get there, but it was the presence of the Lord. And then I watched a whole bunch of Sarah Jakes Roberts uh, sermons, like every day <laughs> on YouTube. I was watching, when I would finish catching up on the sermons from my church that I couldn't see, I would go to Sarah Jakes Roberts and I would watch those. I would go to Elevation Church and watch Stephen Furtick. And I would just try to pour in the word and engage the Lord in his presence in ways that were actually attainable for me at the moment. I couldn't just sit with my Bible and a journal and a pen because I had an infant attached to me. But I did, I could just hit the remote control and um, turn on some things that were edifying, that were true and decide that even in this low place, what I'm gonna feed myself is gonna have to be good stuff because those are the disciplines that are gonna bring me out. I knew that and I had been taught that and that really started working. Apart from that, I also went to counseling because, please, do, do get counseled. I have an amazing Christian counselor and she, walked me through a lot of it and because a counselor can know your past when something like this happens she knew based on things in my past and based on um, what we went through in the delivery room that oh Janice is probably experiencing this and so counseling helped a lot and then just being in community and talking to people outside of my house and honestly having a place to go was huge because it forced me to have to be away from my son, um, leaving him with somebody I trusted, and it forced me to engage other people. And once you 
allow yourself to engage in real community, then people can actually check on you? That is a good question because um, I think in this pregnancy, I was like, now what are you gonna do? You know that this has happened, it could happen again. And I think I've been paying a lot more attention to the signs that kind of overtook me then. Um, I've been paying attention to how they creep up gradually. And on days when I am, there's one thing to be nested, but on days when I'm hypervigilant and I start snapping at people about, this has to go, and I need this to go. That's when I know. Oh, okay, you feel a little anxious. <laughs> and I call, I, t I confess, I'm feeling a little anxious, I'm sorry. Um, as we get closer and as we approach delivery, I am feeling a little nervous, and then I just confess it, and EJ, parents, and friends can, one, um, just try to meet me in that place like we trust the Lord and say all the right things and then I book counseling like you know what it would be crazy for me not to come see you and say I'm anxious that I might be anxious <laughs> and just kind of talk that through and dig deep and I think in this pregnancy I have um, because I was trying to be preemptive I discovered some places that I didn't know when I was pregnant Gabriel about my past and my childhood and things that were triggers for me that I didn't know had been triggers for me. And so it's like the Lord has allowed me to defeat certain Goliaths as a mom. You know, it's everything, I believe everything about our lives the Lord uses um, to sanctify us. And I think there's some very real victories that I've been able to get as a mom now. Um, even having gone through postpartum depression, I wouldn't trade it because I wouldn't know what the Lord gave me victory over um, if I didn't go through it. I would tell a mom in the thick of postpartum depression right now, something that my friend A.D. Kemp reminds me of as I approach having kid number two, and that's that this ends. You know, the one thing, I don't know if the woman is experiencing her first child or whatever, but this season, by definition, ends. And if you get help, the faster you get help, the faster it can end. But knowing that it ends and knowing that it's temporary can be such an encouragement. This is a season, there is help for it, and you can get to the other side. I think I would say, tell somebody how you feel, how you've been feeling, um, and just start to pray that the Lord would show you who you can be honest with, and then try a Christian counselor. It's been very, very helpful for me. And then of course, the three disciplines I always talk about that work are worshiping, praying, and studying the Word. Those three things work. If you worship consistently, worship the Lord consistently, if you pray consistently, giving God what is honest and laying it at His feet. If you come to the Word and ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate the Scriptures for you, if you do those things consistently, do you think that the Lord will not meet you? It's absolutely crazy to think that He would meet you there. So I would say community, counseling, and then the Christian disciplines, they work. And all three of them work amazingly well together. This is Janice Games, and thank you for watching Backstage Bonus. Make sure that you scroll down and like, subscribe, and comment. And I'll talk back to you. It's been great talking to y'all about this. If you have questions, solutions, you want to add something to it that the Lord has done for you, do so. I think, um, you know, when the Bible says we comfort others with the comfort that we've been given, like nothing we go through is just for us. So if you have a word too, put it in the comment section. Thanks for watching. See you next time.